All right, well, uh, it's great to be with you here uh, this morning to talk about some of the research we've done at, uh, at CDC uh, focused on chlorine dioxide. Uh, we have a, a program looking at uh, disinfection. Want to take that away? Sure, okay. <clears throat> Of, um, for, 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 pool, for swimming pools, um, and we've, we've done a number of disinfection studies uh, over, over the years and, uh, and have recently um, and published actually on chlorine dioxide uh, research. Um, and I'm, I've co-authored this with uh, Dr. Jennifer Murphy who actually did all the work uh, yeah, that you'll be seeing uh, in the talk. So it wouldn't be a CDC talk without surveillance data or a figure like this. So you're, you're probably used to them. If you come to CDC talks, you always see figures like this. Uh, and they basically just set the context. Um, by the way, is this OK? Is it too loud? Are we good? OK, we're good. OK. Um, so uh, and basically, this is just to show, of course, that, that reported um, uh, outbreaks of recreational uh, water illness, uh, gastrointestinal illness, have increased over, over the years. Um, and a lot of that's due to um, improve reporting and investigations. Um, but a, a lot of it is, is due to the, uh, the, uh, the recognition, of course, in the blue bars there of, of, of outbreaks re related to treated water venues associated with cryptosporidium um, infections. And so that's really the focus. It's such, it's such a major player that that's, it's really a, a major focus of our program uh, for, for research. Um, and so if you look at those, those treated recreational water outbreaks, and you look at the different pathogens that have been associated with, the, with those outbreaks, uh, sure you get a few here and there that are related to bac bacteria or viruses, maybe even Giardia, but those are usually due to poor um, operations or in, in, in insufficient um, operation management of the pools um, often. Uh, because if chlorine is present, if you have your disinfection, um, disinfectant there at the, at the levels that we expect to have, all those microbes are chlorine sensitive and should be taken care of. But really, cryptosporidium is not. It's extremely chlorine tolerant and is therefore a major uh, issue still with, um, if for um, uh, uh, outbreaks associated with treated water, uh, recreational water venues. So um, looking at the OS system cells, so as I've already mentioned, you've probably heard this before, how, how chlorine tolerant they are. Um, and this is likely due to the thick wall that protects the infectious sporozoites that are inside the crypto oocyst. Um, when people are sick uh, with cryptosporidiasis, they can shed up to a million of these oocysts in a gram of feces. So you can get a lot of shedding uh, from, a, from an ill swimmer if they have an uh, uh, incident or, uh, in a pool. Uh, and it's, it's so highly infectious that as few as 10 can get somebody sick. So you don't need, so a lot can be excreted, uh, and then you don't need to ingest much to get sick. And so that's why um, that it's, it's, it's such a risk then for adults, uh, kids, who we know, you know there's incidental ingestion during swimming. So uh, you put all this together and, it, and, it's a, and it's a big risk in treated water venues. So uh, CDC uh, has had recommendations for many years related to how to respond to diarrheal illnesses. Um, and so hyperchlorination uh, has been the kind of the standard uh, response protocol for, for quite a while, and that protocol includes uh, raising the, uh, typically the level of free chlorine, or FC, uh, in a pool to about 20 milligrams per liter, and allowing exposure time for about 12.75 hours. So that it seems really specific, but the idea there, it's based on research, to hit a, what we call a CT level of, if you multiply those two together, um, 15,300 milligram minutes per liter. So that's basically a combination of the, uh, the disinfectant concentration C uh, times the exposure time T that's, a, that's, a, that's needed to get, in this case, a three log or 99.9% .9 inactivation of cryptosporidium. So that's sort of the standard now uh, to, to reach for preventing transmission um, in a pool that has been contaminated by cryptosporidium. So to, to kill it and, and kill the crypto and return the pool to a safe, safe operation. So 12.75 hours is actually a pretty long time. Um, and it's not just in that exposure time, it's the time to get the chlorine concentration up, the time for exposure, and the time to let the chlorine concentration come back down so that people can swim in the pool again um, at normal, you know, one to three milligrams per liter typical free chlorine concentration. So that's a lot of lost operation time for, for any aquatics venue. It's a big issue. 
So um, there, are, there are a number of different pool and spa chemical disinfectants that are available, of course. Chlorine-based, there are bromine-based, uh, there's ozone even um, as, as chemical disinfectants. You'll see here I've, I've, I've kind of differentiated them a little bit by as primary or secondary disinfectants. Primary basically meaning that the disinfectant is in the pool water uh, throughout the pool, the, the system. And so if, there, if a pathogen is shed into the water, that disinfectant immediately starts inactivating the, the shed pathogen, you know, in, in the bulk water. Uh, whereas like ozone is a secondary disinfectant because it has no residual, so it's not necessarily out in the bulk pool water. The water has to be drawn through a treatment unit and then the disinfection occurs in the treatment unit. So, so that's, a, that's a different kind of uh, approach to disinfection. Um, of the chlorine-based disinfectants, of course, there's a whole family of them, whether it's chlorine gas, which really isn't used in, in, in the pool facilities, and more for drinking water, uh, sodium or calcium hypochlorite, there's stabilized chlorine, chlorine dioxide, there's uh, electrolytic generation of, of hypochlorous acid. Um, I'm gonna focus, of course, in this talk on chlorine dioxide. Um, and, uh, the reason for that is <clears throat> it's actually been around for a while. It's been used in drinking water for quite a while. It's actually a surprise to see it's even used in, uh, in recreational water in the early 20th century, um, in the early 1900s in, in, in Belgium. I found a report of that. So it's been around a while. It hasn't really been adopted for pools especially, um, but it, it's certainly been one of the choices as an alternative disinfectant. Uh, it's more commonly used for surface disinfectant, if you're spraying surfaces, uh, biofilm removal in pipes, uh, and just you know, drinking water treatment uh, in general. So uh, why study chlorine dioxide for pool treatment? So as I mentioned already, this 12.7 hour exposure time plus all the other time associated with that response protocol is a pretty long amount of time uh, just, just from the get-go. But then if you add in the issue, and I know it's been talked about a lot about um, stabilizers, uh, when I'm gonna refer to them as cyanuric acid just as sort of the, the uh, kind of broad term for them. Um, and there's been some research, and we've published some research ourselves, that show that cyanuric acid can even slow down the effectiveness of chlorine further. So, so there's a bit of an issue there with how to effectively return pools to safe, uh, safe conditions after a diarrheal incident, especially if uh, the, the, the disinfectant has been stabilized. So chlorine dioxide has the potential then to significantly shorten treatment times in response to diarrheal illnesses. So uh, I'll admit first, uh, first off, you know, I've, I've done some work along this, but if, you know, I'm not as much of an expert as folks maybe in this room who do chlorine dioxide uh, generation or in, in that part of the industry. So feel free to step, step up after the talk and uh, talk more about your experience with chlorine dioxide. But the textbook um, things to talk about with chlorine dioxide are that it's, it's a pretty unique disinfectant in many ways. Um, so it's neutral, um, and it's, and it's got a pretty highly, it's in a, present in a highly oxidative state, so it's got a lot of oxidation potential. Um, <clears throat> it's a selective oxidant <clears throat> in that it only transfers this one electron, um, and basically its main product is chlorite when it's added to, added to water. Um, and then that chloride can then uh, form uh, other, other uh, chemical compounds like chlorate, uh, chloride as well. Um, what's interesting about chloride, um, it's gonna be the primary uh, product uh, uh, because um, it, it, at the pH in the pools is above this pKa threshold for chloride. So that means mo when chlorine dioxide is added, it's really chloride is a major um, uh, uh, product that's, that's of concern because it's of human health concern, chloride and chlorate. So that's, we'll talk about that later, but that's a, it's an important issue to think about with chlorine dioxide um, beyond its disinfection efficacy is its, uh, its safety and, and, and uh, any health issues with using it. Uh, what's also interesting with chlorine dioxide is uh, it differs from chlorine in that when you add it to water, if there are organics in the water, chlorine dioxide does not react with those organics to create halogenated uh, byproducts. So these disinfection byproducts you hear a lot with drinking water. Uh, so it doesn't create trihalomethanes, doesn't create haloacetic acids, et cetera, but it does create, of course, chloride and chlorate. So that's its, an issue. That's its main issue. Um, it's highly soluble in water, um, so it doesn't, it doesn't take on hydrogen atoms and doesn't hydro, hydrolyze. It's primarily, when you put it into water, it's there as a gas. So think of like, you know, gas, not bubbles necessarily, but gas in the, in the water, and that's how it's, it's reacting. Um, it's, a, it's a dissolved gas uh, in, the, in the water. Um, it's 10 times more soluble than chlorine, and it's highly volatile. It's in this gas state. It's highly oxidative. It's highly volatile. So there's some things to remind. It's a pretty powerful uh, chemical to use, but it has those issues uh, related to, that are very different from chlorine. 
Um, it can be generated uh, in liquid form, and this is typically done on site uh, in commercial generators. Uh, the kind of traditional process, and again, we maybe have a discussion after the talk about maybe newer processes, but is to use chlorine gas uh, with water and uh, to create uh, hypochlorous acid and hydrochloric acid, so you need this acid uh, and the hypochlorous um, acid, and then the, you add sodium chloride, so that's the main kind of additive, reacts with those other products to create the chlorine dioxide. Um, so all that is generated on site. Um, you cannot produce chlorine dioxide gas and compress it, it's too explosive and, and you can't ship it around, it has to be done on site uh, as a, in this kind of liquid um, form. Uh, and these ratios must be carefully controlled so you don't get unwanted byproducts uh, like chlorate. There's also, um, anybody who does backpacking would know this, um, maybe, uh, there's, a, there's a stabilized uh, solid form, a tablet form, um, that is activated when you add the tablet to water, um, and like I said, it's been, it's been used for backpacking and other kind of um, uh, um, uses. In, in our laboratory, we've used this product from BASF called the Septrol. Um, it has the sodium chloride in it, uh, and it has a stabilizer as well, dichlor uh, isocyanurate as well. Um, and then it's got some other ingredients. So when you add the sodium chloride, it makes the reaction and it produces the chlorine dioxide in the water when you, when you add the tablet. Okay. So just a bit on chlorine uh, dioxide measurement. Uh, this will become important later on, actually, for, for a research project that we're going to start, uh, we're starting right now. Um, so water can contain, um, obviously, chlorine, right? So the chlorine is, free chlorine is the main um, uh, disinfectant used in pools. So when you're doing chlorine dioxide treatment, often there's going to be chlorine present. There could be chloride as well. So you've got all these chlorine species. And so there are some methods to try to uh, tease out uh, which chlorine species is which. Um, if you use just these, uh, the DPD method, that's been standard methods for a long time, this DPD1 version of the chemical gives you free chlorine. You use a different, slightly different version of the chemo chemical, you can get total chlorine. But if you add this chemical glycine to the water, it binds with the free chlorine, which would then allow the chlor chlorine dioxide to be measured. So that's, what, that's the main method that we use. Um, it is still this DPD technology. And if you want to test for chloride, then there's this whole process for acidifying and neutralizing. It's a little complicated. Um, but there are methods, though, to tease out those different species, which is, which is important. Um, there are all also now, uh, if, um, for online sensors, there are chlorine dioxide sensors that use a selective membrane that allow continuous inline monitoring. So some of your bigger facilities, whether they're drinking water or if it's using a recreational water facility, you'll see these in, inline monitors more often. People aren't going to be doing this wet chemistry approach, not most likely. So there's been some research previously, <laughs> some, there's been quite a lot of research. I mean, as early as the 1940s, the 1960s, People have been looking at chlorine dioxide uh, and its efficacy. Most of it was focused on drinking water back then, and most of those big, you know, big outbreaks were you know, typhoid and cholera and things like that. So most of those early studies were on bacteria and bacterial spores. And so multiple studies found chlorine dioxide to be more effective than chlorine and side-by-side -side comparisons for killing bacteria. Dosages for the chlorine dioxide were in this one to five milligram per liter range. Um, uh, some research in the 60s found that you know, E. coli was killed um, at a high rate within 30 seconds uh, with chlorine dioxide, less than a milligram per liter. So uh, it's, it's highly effective. Um, one, one thing, and this is not surprising for a chemical dis disinfectant, but you know, if it, temperature does affect the, uh, the disinfectant um, uh, rate of kill. Um, and that's, that's no great surprise for a chemical disinfectant, but that's one thing to keep in mind. Uh, not a big deal for, for pool water, because we're at the warmer temperatures in pools most often, where you're going to get your fast, faster chemical reactions. So it's not a big deal. Um, and then in, in other comparisons with chlorine then, um, again, as I mentioned before, it's not as reactive as chlorine with organic compounds or ammonia. Um, does not generally produce these trihalomethanes or other uh, halo, uh, or halogenated organics. Uh, pH has been found or been reported to be uh, less of an, have less of an impact on chlorine dioxide. Um, with increased kill, uh, so there's been some work, was work in the 70s and 80s on poliovirus. Uh, and even some pathogens. In fact, you get increased uh, kill of those, of those microbes as the pH increases, up to about a uh, pH of nine. So, um, whereas just the opposite occurs with free chlorine, where you get decreased efficacy at the higher pHs. 
Um, and then a fair amount of work was actually done on parasites, Cryptosporidium, Giardia, in the 1990s, early 2000s, um, that found that corn dioxide was effective against those parasites. However, those methods back then were, uh, they used um, methods that weren't as, I, I hate to say modern or advanced as what we're using now, but they weren't using infectivity assays. So, and I'll explain the infectivity assay that we use, so it's, which we feel is a better measure of the inactivation of or kill of, of, the, of these parasites with these disinfectants. And they didn't have the modeling techniques back then that we do now um, to really look at um, and get a better accurate uh, estimation of the contact times and the inactivation rates with the disinfectant. Okay. So uh, let's dive into our study then. So it's basically, it's a jar, it's a jar study, right? Uh, so we've got a bunch of flasks, um, basically five different types of flasks that we have, um, we create all at the same time, they're all completely mixed. Um, one of the flasks is just what we call oxidant demand-free water. So it, ha it shouldn't consume the oxidant, it's just water, we seed it with the osis to make sure that they don't just die off naturally. So that's just a control, quality control. Then we have a control that's hyperchlorination control. That's the 20 milligram per liter FC or free chlorine flask. Um, and then we've got a two milligram per liter um, uh, free chlorine control as well because two milligrams per liter was going to, is gonna be the, the uh, we wanted to see if there was decay of the, uh, the free chlorine on its own because in the chlorine dioxide flask, the two on the right, those flasks either had five or one milligrams per liter. That's a target level of chlorine dioxide. The actual concentrations varied around five and one. Um, or we had a combined disinfectant of the chlorine dioxide at those same levels plus the two milligrams per liter, and that was basically our attempt to say that what a typical pool concentration of free chlorine would be. Um, I actually think I've got some other things here. Um, and we were, adding, we were creating the chlorine dioxide again with these aseptrol uh, tablets. The, uh, so after creating these, uh, and then oh, it's another important thing to mention is that the cryptosporidium isolate we use is, was the Iowa isolate, and this gets a little technical, but the Iowa isolate is the one isolate that's been more widely available, it's been used for many, many, many years, uh, and a lot of the literature is based on, on this particular isolate. So that's the reason we wanted to initially use this. But there's also been some, been some data from, from, our, from CDC that has shown that the Iowa isolate is a bit more sensitive to chlorine inactivation than another isolate which we, was isolated from Maine. And so if you look in the literature, there, there's the Maine isolate as well, and that's actually what the current CT recommendations for a um, hyperchlorination response are based on that main isolate because it's a bit more tolerant of chlorine, so it's a bit more conservative. So just, just to kind of point that out right now, but we're working on the one that's a bit more, bit more wimpy, so to speak, or at least we think it is. Um, okay, so we, we cover the flask, completely stir them, maintain a 25 degree C, and then we start pulling, we start pulling samples. Um, so we pull our samples, and we measure free chlorine, we measure chlorine dioxide, we measure ORP as another measure of, of oxidation uh, potential activity. Um, we, uh, for, and we measure pH as well, with our target pH being 7.5, again, just trying to model typical pH in pools. Um, and uh, then we, at, so we measure all those things, and then we also perform this infectivity assay. Uh, which I'll go into a little bit here. So before that infectivity assay, so we have to neutralize the chlorine, sodium thiol sulfate, uh, and the chlorine dioxide, and we have to concentrate the osis down to a very small amount to be added to these, um, these cells that we, that we infect. Um, we, uh, prior to doing that, though, we have to exist, and that's a kind of a weird technical word, but basically means breaking open the osis so those sporozoites inside can get out, and then they do the infection of the, of the cells in the laboratory uh, setup. Um, then we incubate those cells that have been infected uh, for uh, a little more than two days and then, and then look at the infection uh, that occurred. So um, the slides look like that on the right side. Um, they're um, NDCK cells, which is basically just a mammalian uh, cell line from dogs, um, but it's receptive to cryptosporidium uh, in infectivity. Um, after they're infected, you have to wash off the, uh, the sample that didn't, uh, that didn't stick, so to speak. Uh, and you label the, the um, if the infection occurs, then there you get these life stages of cryptosporidium in those cells. So they've gone through a little bit of these life stages, and we've got antibodies, like you have antibodies in your body that respond to if you've been infected with something. We've got antibodies in a, you know, in a test tube that we can add to these cells, and they will react with 
those life stages of cryptosporidium, and they're fluorescent. And so wherever they stick, wherever they find a true, o, not an osis, but a sporozoite or these other kind of life stages, they fluoresce. And then we look on a microscope for that fluorescence, and we have a special microscope that's got a camera attached to it that can pick up that fluorescence, each of the little dots or spots, um, and it can count. And we've taught that microscope with software how to identify what's a true um, life stage of cryptosporidium that, that's, that represents an infection and what's just sort of junk or that's just in there. So we've taught this software how to recognize things and then it does this counting and then we use those data to calculate inactivation rates and things like that. Um, this image in the left is what the microscope sees. So it sees the starry, starry night, so to speak, of, of um, what we think are life stages of cryptosporidium that infected these cells. Um, and then the software takes that and says, yeah, not all of that is really crypto. Um, those ones over there are. And then actually, we manually flip through and, make sh and double check. And just, just, I, don't trust, I don't trust software necessarily, and neither should you, and computers. And so we still do that, although this study took, collected 17,000 images. So Jennifer Murphy went about cross-eyed going through 17,000 images, double checking the computer. But, um, but she did it. Um, so in addition to that quality control, we also did some other quality control. Uh, and here are some of the results. So we were shooting for 20 milligrams per liter free chlorine. We hit about 21 on average, so that was good. We tried for five milligrams per liter chlorine dioxide. You always get a very, little bit of variability. So it's actually truly 5.4. For one milligrams per liter, there's more variability when you get to lower levels, lower concentrations. So it's actually, it was actually 1.4 at the start of the experiments. And then for free chlorine, that was more of a sort of a, a crapshoot, so to speak. We really were trying to hit two, but we actually were hitting more like 2.6 to 3.6 um, on the free chlorine concentrations. pH was just what, basically what we targeted. And for ORP, for those of you who like your ORP data, you'll find this interesting. So when no disinfectant was present, you don't see much oxidation potential, right? 373 millivolts, just think of that as a number that's low. Uh, and then it goes up quite a bit, meaning a lots of oxidation potential when you put a little free chlorine in. Uh, if you put more free chlorine in, go from two to 20, you get even higher oxidation potential. Uh, and then you can see then, we'll relate that to the chlorine dioxide for the five milligram per liter. Um, when there was free chlorine or there wasn't free chlorine, we hit about 720. So pretty much in the same range of, as hyperchlorination with the five milligram per liter. But even the one milligram per liter, um, when there wasn't free chlorine, it was down lower, so not as oxidative, but with the free chlorine, just two, well, in this case, 3.6 milligrams per liter free chlorine and approximately one milligram per liter chlorine dioxide, we're up at 712. So that's, that's a pretty good oxidation level uh, with pretty low levels of these, these disinfectants. Uh, in addition to that, then, chlorine dioxide, highly oxidative, it decays, right? It's reacting with lots of things, and so it's gonna decay pretty quickly through these jar, these flask experiments. And we weren't trying to like add more in, add more in. We, we set it up at the beginning, and we just monitored, monitored the decay through the, uh, through the experiments. But we used this HA model, which was developed by Chuck Haas from Drexel. And he's a collaborator in the project um, and co-author of the paper. And uh, so he developed this model, which, which takes into account the disinfectant decay. So that C in CT for these experiments isn't constant. It's, it's degrading. So you need this model to track it as it degrades and your oocysts are dying off. That's a little complicated, but, but he has this model and, 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 and did the analyses uh, for us. Um, in addition, so the free chlorine decay, free chlorine also decays, but uh, in our experiments it wasn't really that much. Uh, we never got below one milligram per liter. We didn't find that to be really significant for the experiments. So that we, tr we, we treated as constant. Uh, and then the ORP, of course, generally decreased with decrease in chlorine dioxide concentration. So, okay, let's look at some data. So uh, the top row here is really just your control data. That's just hyperchlorination. So the left column, there's no chlorine dioxide. You got your, you got your uh, 20 milligrams, 21 milligrams per liter free chlorine. And if you look across there, you know, one, uh, one log, in, so one log is 90%, 99%, and then 99.9% .9 kills your three log. Okay. Um, and uh, it took about 7.6 hours for the experiment to complete at 21 milligrams per liter, and you get a three log inactivation of about 9,600, and that's pretty well in tune with previous reported literature. I think the one that we reported from CDC for the Iowa isolate was 10,400. So we like to see that kind of data because it makes us feel confident that this new experimental setup, this new set of data, the cells, the oocysts, everything is reproducible and fits within a lineage of past 
uh, data. So you can feel more confident in this brand new data, which is this chlorine dioxide data. Um, and so the chlorine dioxide, the second, uh, second row here, chlorine dioxide at five milligrams per liter, 5.4, um, and then no free chlorine. And if you just look, look at those numbers, the, the time to get those inactivation levels is so much shorter. Um, and for a three log inactivation, about two hours. And the CT value there of 640, so over an order of magnitude shorter. Uh, and then if you throw a little free chlorine in, it's even shorter. I mean, there's, the, the differential is not that great there, but it's even a little bit shorter. Um, here's just examples of the curves. This is from the paper. So if you're looking down there, that's the paper that was published on this, this research. Um, the, uh, the left side there is the observed data. Uh, that's just fitted with a, a, a smooth fitting line there. Uh, and the top are the data with the five milligrams per liter chlorine dioxide without the free chlorine. And the one below, this, the, the solid squares are with free chlorine. Again, this is about, this is 2.6 milligrams per liter free chlorine. Uh, so you can just see that it's significantly different. There's definitely a difference there when the free chlorine is there. There's definitely some kind of synergistic effect, that's a, not just additive, but more than that probably going on there between those two disinfectants. The one on the right is the fitted curves with the HA model, this, this kinetics model. Thank you. Um, uh, it's the same data, but you can see the, the lines fitted there a little bit more, and that's what we did to uh, do the statistics and calculate the, the kinetics inactivation rates for the uh, for these experiments. Now, looking at the lower chlorine dioxide level, so now we're down at 1.4 milligrams per liter. The top row is still that, those, that, those controls with the hyperchlorination. So the middle row there is, again, chlorine dioxide without free chlorine. And of course, it's lower levels, right? So you're going to get higher um, times for kills um, here than you saw in the previous slide. Uh, but even for three log inactivation, it's still about 14 hours. So that's I mean, it's, it's long, so that's you know, maybe not going to work for, as a response you know, um, uh, protocol, for response protocol. But remember, when you do a response protocol, you're going to have some free chlorine in the pool. So in fact, the lower level, the lower row is probably the one that's more realistic. So 1.4 with some free chlorine there. It's on the little high side, so, but, but I don't think it's that big a deal. That's 3.6. Um, and then we're down to about five hours um, for a three, three log inactivation. Now these experiments were really hard to perform because the chlorine dioxide at those lower levels gets to non-detect pretty quickly, and it's really hard to track. Everything happens so much faster um, that it was it was just it was hard to track. So we weren't actually able to collect all the data that the HOM model really needed to calculate inactivation rates, the kinetics to generate the CT values. So you see there's no, it's chopped off. There's no last column there with CT values. So that's a little bit um, disappointing maybe, but I think certainly the data is suggestive that the low levels of, of chlorine dioxide with free chlorine present were, were pretty effective. Okay, let's see here, get some conclusions. Um, so just to kind of recap. So with the higher levels of, free, of the chlorine dioxide, you know, we're down two hours basically to get to a three log or 99.9% .9 reduction, so that's really super fast compared to hyperchlorination. Um, those CT values that we, we calculated, 640 to 525, are over an order of magnitude lower than for, for hyperchlorination, uh, which is 10,400 for this isolate. It's higher, of course, for the main isolate, the 15,300 is for main. Um, for solutions containing the 1.4 milligrams per liter chlorine dioxide, the times that were needed to achieve the three log were, you know, 14 hours. That's a little bit long, but obviously lo low, much shorter substantially uh, uh, effect was noticed with, with the free chlorine presence. That's really interesting. Um, we feel like this data fits in well with the, with the previous literature because our controls, our hyperchlorination controls were pretty much in tune with previous literature. The HA model, we use that to account for chlorine dioxide decay and estimating the CT value, so we feel like that's, that's good. Hopefully you can, you can trust the data even more. Um, the synergistic effect, so at two milligrams per liter free chlorine, theoretically, if you're taking the um, the 12.75 hours as your, your response you know, exposure time, two milligrams per liter would then require, instead of 20, no, it's 20 milligrams per liter for 12.75, so it would be two milligrams per liter, we need 127 hours. This is all theoretical um, for a three log krypton activation. So with five milligrams of chlorine dioxide, we went from 2.1 to 1.8 hours, and of course a bigger jump there with the, um, at the lower level. So, um, Certainly, things are things are happening much faster, and that free chlorine seems to be helping a lot. Um, so it'll be interesting to follow up on this uh, further. A similar effect, the synergistic effect, this combination between the two disinfectants, has been reported by others, but those studies were focused on bacteria. 
Uh, so this is the first, or bacterial spores. So this is the first with parasites. Uh, and the suggested mechanism for this, and this hasn't been really ferreted out very well, but they think that chlorine dioxide basically reacts with that cell wall and makes it more porous, uh, thus allowing more of it to get in, but also more of the free chlorine to get in. So the free chlorine isn't really good at getting through the cell wall. You need a lot of it and a lot of exposure to get through there, but this chlorine dioxide might loosen things up, allowing the free chlorine to get in much faster. So um, that's just theory right now. Um, so I'm gonna do a couple slides on cautions, um, because this part of it gets beyond me. I do disinfection work and the microbiology, et cetera, but you know, EPA's got some standards for chlorine dioxide for drinking water set at 0.8 milligrams per liter. Of course, this is for drinking, right? People aren't supposed to be drinking pool water, but they're certain, certainly related. There is some ingestion that occurs during swimming. And the level for taste and odor is even a little bit lower, 0 0.4, 0 0.5. So remember, we're working, all this disinfection data is at one to five milligrams per liter. Um, and so while no halogenated disinfection byproducts are formed with chlorine dioxide, it does result in chloride and chlorate production, which can accumulate uh, unless it's removed. Uh, chlorate, I don't actually know what removals are for chlorate, but chlorate, you would need activated carbon to remove the chlorite, et cetera. So you need to, uh, you need to or else it would just accumulate. And the MCL, or maximum contaminant lim limit for dis dis drinking water, is one milligram per liter. So again, that's, that's a pretty low amount, especially when uh, experts like Phil Singer at UNC that know their chemistry say, if you add two milligrams per liter of chlorine dioxide, you should expect to get one to 1 1.4 milligrams per liter of chloride. So we're all, there's gonna be some issues there with effectiveness levels for disinfection versus these unwanted kind of byproducts and what, what standards are, are reasonable for pools. Um, it's also unclear what the chlorine dioxide stability would be um, and what residuals there would be formed when applied to real world water, right? This is all ideal pool water. So we don't have all the bather loading chemicals in there with the sweat and the urine, the you know, personal care products, all that stuff. We also don't have sunlight to, uh, further decaying the chlorine dioxide. So those are other issues. Um, and then for safety, I talked about this before, it's highly volatile. Um, you know, it needs to be manufactured on site because it can't be compressed or shipped around. Uh, and that volatility and the uh, potential explosiveness is, is an issue. So uh, anybody wanting to use this or people developing generators obviously have this in mind to make it safe for, for use at aquatics facilities. Um, real quick, NSPF has, has awarded us some funding this year. Um, to do some additional research in chlorine dioxide. And what we're gonna, I'm stealing a little bit of my thunder from my afternoon talk with cyanuric acid, but that, the, the focus of that project is going to be, can chlorine dioxide achieve these faster kill rates in a pool in which we have these, this issue with cyanuric acid slowing down the efficacy of chlorine, chlorine for doing hyperchlorination and you know, killing crypto. So could, could chlorine, chlorine dioxide be a new way of doing um, response for those uh, stabilized pools, uh, chlorine pools? So, so that'll hopefully, maybe next year, I can come here and pr present some of that data. So thank you. For those that are interested, the, uh, the seminar on the effects of cyanuric acid is at four o'clock in this very same room with the very same uh, Dr. Hill. Are there any questions? Yes. Uh, has the EPA approved this for use in swimming pools? I, be I believe it is. That, does anybody else here know that? It's, it's, not, it's not approved specifically for swimming pools. Thank you. All right, so there's an important, thank you for asking that question. I thought, I thought it was, but thank you for, do you, know, do you have more information? I don't know if CDC or anyone for remediation has gone through to try to get an exception, but for certainly for regular you know, use and so on, it's not approved for swimming pools. That's one of the issues is that that's gotta get uh, overcome. I mean, at least for remediation purposes. So it is, it, it is though in you know, catadine, micropure, MP1 things and other tablets and stuff. For, so for drinking water, you're allowed to drink the stuff. You put it in tablet, you put it in, four hours later you can drink it. But the, what they have to do is they have to go through all their swim model, through skin absorption, you know, the whole rigmarole that they do for all the disinfectants. So that hasn't happened for swimming pools. Thank you. I had just one question. Um, whenever you have a high concentration, like 20 parts per million of uh, of chlorine in your water, you're going to have to dissipate that in some way. And sodium thiosulfate is used. Do you have to do the same thing for the chlorine dioxide 
and the sodium thiosulfate work. So chlorine oxide should decay much faster. Um, I mean, it's going to volatilize, and if you're recirculating, I, I don't exactly know how fast like a large pool could be returned, you know, for that decay to occur. But sodium thiosulfate does is effective for chlorine oxide as well. It does bind. With it. So you, that same approach would work, but you probably wouldn't have to do as much of it because I think you're going to get faster decay of the di chlorine oxide. Yes. So do you know, happen to know that if you dechlorinate in that way or do you, you know, use thiosulfate or some reducing agent, do you know if it takes the chlorine dioxide to chlorate, chlorite, or chloride? Because that would be relevant to the, part of the issue right. you talked about before about getting rid of the, the bad stuff, right? So I don't think, and again, anybody with more chemistry background than me can, uh, can chime in, I don't think the sodium thiosulfate would drive that reaction. But that chlorite and chlorate is going to be there just from dumping in a bunch of chlorine dioxide into a pool, and that, re that reaction's already occurred. So I think the thiol sulfate would just remove the, the chlorine dioxide, but the chlorite and chlorate would still be there. I have a, a question. If uh, we're able to stabilize this uh, product for the use of um, uh, purifying water for a camper or a hiker, why can't that same technology be used for pools? We now need a, we need a generator for a pool, but we can get a pill for a, somebody to purify water on a hiking trip. How oh, they do? Makes so, sense, doesn't it? Here we go. Let's let's hand it to this gentleman right here. He was getting pointed. At, he was getting pointed at. No, he's the one. He's from Australia. Yes. Yeah. Well, I can't give you the name of the uh, manufacturer, but they are being uh, produced in sealed um, uh, bags. Yeah, and all you do is tear the bag open and throw it in the, and it dissolves up very quickly, as you've pointed out in your lecture, that it's uh, it dissolves very quickly. So the uh, results are very quick as well, within two hours, something like that. Okay, I, I'd like to follow up with you more about that, because I wasn't sure how much of that solid matrix would be needed for a relatively large pool, yeah. and whether that was practical. Uh, yeah, right, okay. So you heard it Thank here, um, Australia has Alka-Seltzer for your pool. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I forget what I was gonna say now. Um, yeah, a gentleman over there wanted to. While he's walking over, let me say, um, I was remiss in getting my slides in on time, so these slides are not in the proceedings. But I would be happy uh, if you want to write down your email address or give me your card. I'm totally happy with sending you a PDF of the slides uh, after this. So I brought it on myself to do that extra work by not getting my slides in on time. So just to make one comment to add to Australia and everything like that, there. There are several products, and there's another product globally that's in use um, that presently, as of today, over a million swimmers every day are in a swimming pool that has chlorine dioxide in it. Yeah. Correct. So it's, as we say, it's an EPA issue. Yeah. It's not, it's, it's a total regulatory issue in the US. It's in use in over 40 countries today, so. Can I ask a question? So do you know that, any, any of you that know that, that experience in other countries, uh, how they address the chloride chlorite issue? Is, are there additional things that need to be done? Are there, there standards that are higher than drinking no. water? Or? Well, I, I, yeah, I, I don't want to mention names and everything like that, but the, the TCDO product, which is a worldwide patented product, actually doesn't create chlorides or chlorate buildup. So that, and there is a gentleman here that could answer that way better than I can. Um, he's the actual manufacturer of the product, and he is doing a couple of talks. So, um, but yeah, so, but okay. it does exist. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Okay, Dr. Hill, I want to thank you very much for your presentation. Again, his next one is at four o'clock.